This leader allows the projectionist to complete adjustments before presenting the film. This voice has the same intensity and tone quality as the narration which follows. The mechanisms of action of the oral contraceptives. A discussion by Edward T. Tyler, M.D. Martin L. Stone, M.D. Melvin R. Cohen, M.D. The correct choice of a particular oral contraceptive for a specific patient can only come from a detailed understanding of how oral contraceptives work and of their underlying pharmacology. We believe, too, that this knowledge will enable you to instruct and motivate your patients so that you will get maximum patient acceptance and effectiveness. Although we all recognize that oral contraception is based primarily on the inhibition of ovulation, we also believe that other factors, including changes in the endometrium and in the cervical mucus, may also contribute to effective contraception. And we will try to show you how these factors may be involved. I'm Dr. Edward Tyler of Los Angeles, and I'll try to summarize for you the ovulation inhibitory effect of the exogenous estrogens and progestogens used in oral contraceptive therapy. This is an eminent medical colleague, Dr. Martin Stone, professor and chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, New York Medical College. He will give you the results of his considerable research into the effects of these hormones on the endometrial cycle. And this is the internationally known fertility specialist, Dr. Melvin Cohen, Associate Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Michael Reese Hospital and Medical Center, and the Chicago Medical School. His years of study in the fields of fertility and infertility have roused in him a special interest in the role played by the various alterations in the cervical mucus during the menstrual cycle. We shall also outline the differences between the two forms of therapy currently in use, the combination and the sequential. But before we can do this, we probably should review some of the normal physiology of the menstrual cycle so that we'll have a frame of reference within which to talk. Throughout our discussion, we will postulate a 28-day cycle, day one of which is the first day of bleeding. Stimulation from the hypothalamus results in the release of gonadotrophins from the anterior pituitary. During the first half of the cycle, the principal gonadotrophin is the follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. Under its influence, follicles develop within the ovary, and these secrete estrogen into the bloodstream. About the middle of the cycle, luteinizing hormone is secreted by the pituitary in increased amounts. One ovarian follicle ruptures, and this is ovulation. During the latter half of the cycle, the ruptured follicle becomes a corpus luteum. It is believed by many that the secretion of a third gonadotrophin, luteotrophic hormone, contributes to the maintenance of the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum secretes both estrogen and progesterone into the bloodstream. As we will re-emphasize later, one of the most important aspects of the normal hormonal relationship during the menstrual cycle is the feedback mechanism operating between the ovarian hormones and the pituitary hormones. FSH stimulates production of estrogen, but as the level of estrogen in the blood rises, it inhibits the secretion of FSH. In a similar fashion, luteinizing hormone leads to production of progesterone, but the increasing amounts of progesterone inhibit the secretion of luteinizing hormone. Toward the end of the cycle, 
the blood levels of both estrogen and progesterone decrease rather sharply. And this withdrawal of hormonal support leads to local tissue and vascular changes resulting in menstruation. Now, estrogen and progesterone both normally produce cyclical changes in the endometrium. And Dr. Stone will tell you about that. We are concerned here primarily with the morphological changes in the upper active portion of the endometrium. During the first half of the cycle, the endometrium proliferates under the influence of the estrogen being secreted by the ovarian follicle. In the first few days of this part of the cycle, the glands are short, straight, and narrow with epithelial mitoses. The regenerating surface epithelium is thin and the stroma is compact with some mitoses. By the 10th day, the surface epithelium is columnar. The glands are longer and curving and pseudostratification has begun. By mid-cycle, the surface epithelium is somewhat undulant. The glands are tortuous and mitoses indicate active growth. The glandular epithelium is pseudostratified. The stroma is moderately dense and is actively growing. During the last half of the normal menstrual cycle, the endometrium goes through a secretory phase under the influence of estrogen and progesterone produced by the corpus luteum. In the first week of the secretory phase, that is the third week of the cycle, recognizable changes are primarily in the gland epithelium. Mitoses and pseudostratification have disappeared. Vasovaculation and, of course, secretion are present. In the last week, the changes are mainly stromal. Such things as edema, predecidual reaction, mitoses, and leukocytic infiltration. Theoretically, this so-called normal sequence of change in the endometrium, and especially the post-ovulatory secretory phase, is necessary for successful implantation. And I suppose this is true for 99% of women, or perhaps I should say 99% of implantations. But I think I should add that what I've described is what you might call a classical normal, and we see many variations from it, especially in the time at which specific changes occur. And we may consider many of these variations normal too, because the women do have successful pregnancies. That's certainly an important point. Now, as I said before, the changing hormonal relationships also have their effects on the cervical mucus. Dr. Cohen, would you elaborate on this? Uh, yes, Dr. Tyler. There are several characteristics of the cervical mucus which change throughout the normal menstrual cycle. The changes are sufficiently marked and sufficiently dependable to provide a fairly accurate test for ovulation. Perhaps more pertinent for a discussion of contraception is the fact that during parts of the cycle, the cervical mucus inhibits the penetration of sperm, while at other times it promotes this activity. The mucus is obtained from the endocervix with a glass cannula. When it is blown out on a glass slide, we estimate the amount and rate it from zero to four plus. A glass cover slip is placed on the glob of mucus and then lifted off again very gently. The mucus has a different viscosity and a different amount of spin barkite or stretchability at different times in the cycle. And this is measured in centimeters. The cover slip is then replaced and the slide is examined for the presence of leukocytes and spermatozoa. After that, the mucus is allowed to dry. The endocervical mucus taken from a healthy, untreated patient at about the time of ovulation usually crystallizes in a well-defined, fern-like pattern within minutes. At other times in the normal menstrual cycle, this pattern is more poorly defined or absent. In our so-called normal cycle, unopposed estrogen secreted by the ovarian follicles during the first two weeks 
stimulates the production of cervical mucus. At the same time, its viscosity decreases. For example, at about day seven, the mucus is sparse and thick, and it has a spin bar kite of only about a centimeter. Sperm survival is practically nil. And the fern test is negative. By mid-cycle, the mucus is profuse and thin. It has a spin bar kite of 15 to 20 centimeters. Sperm survival is excellent. And the fern test is now positive. During the last half of the cycle, progesterone secreted by the corpus luteum progressively opposes the estrogen. And this causes a complete reversal of the changes that occurred during the first half. It is our opinion that the thin, perfused cervical mucus that we normally find at mid-cycle is an important factor in fertility because only such a mucus can facilitate entry of the spermatozoa into the uterus. We consider then that these three factors, ovulation, a receptive cervical mucus, and an endometrium adequate for good implantation of a fertilized ovum, are among those factors necessary for conception. All three are dependent on a fairly delicately balanced sequence of changing hormonal relationships which can be altered rather easily by a number of influences. For example, responses to shock or to environmental changes such as altitude can inhibit the hypothalamic pituitary relationship to such an extent that ovulation does not occur. And with the oral contraceptives, the hormonal relationships are altered by simply adding balanced amounts of exogenous estrogens and progestogens to the normal picture. Now, what happens when these exogenous hormones are administered to the normal healthy female patient? Well, of course, that depends on how they're administered. In combination therapy, they're administered together in balanced dosages for the whole period of therapy within each menstrual cycle. In sequential therapy, estrogen alone is administered for about three quarters of the time, and then estrogen and progesterone together for the remainder. The two types of therapy don't produce quite the same changes in the normal sequence of events. That's true. We'll have to show what happens to the normal cycle with each type of therapy. Let's take the combination therapy first. You'll remember that I mentioned a feedback mechanism. Well, if both estrogen and progestogen blood levels are kept high throughout most of the cycle, they block the secretion of the pituitary hormones throughout the cycle. The results are that the follicles do not mature, ovulation does not occur, and no corpus luteum is formed. In the endometrium, the combined effects of exogenous estrogen and progestogen throughout the cycle produce a comparatively rapid involution, leading to a suppressed static picture. During the first week, the proliferative activity of the glands and stroma is slight. The mucosa is never as thick as during a normal cycle, and the mitotic activity of the glandular epithelium is scanty. Secretory activity, which normally occurs in the latter half of the cycle, appears in the second week. It may last only two or three days, and it is less pronounced than in the normal cycle. The glands remain narrow, with only slight tortuosity, and the stroma shows only moderate edema. From day 11 on, secretory action is no longer present. The glandular epithelium becomes flat, and the gland lumina narrow down. By day 20 or 21, glandular exhaustion is complete. When you compare this sequence of changes with the so-called normal, it's obvious that the influence of the progestogen during the first half of the cycle has speeded up the whole progression. The result is that during the latter half of the cycle, you have an endometrium which is probably not of a type suitable for implantation. 
However, we do recognize that on certain rare occasions, a fertilized egg might implant itself anywhere. Would you call the anometrium pathological? No, it's just different. Different from what you might expect on a given day. The timing of the changes is off as a result of the medication. But after all, the normal menstrual cycle is a fertile cycle. And we're deliberately trying to make it infertile with the oral contraceptives. I don't quite know why we should expect or want a normal endometrial cycle. In any case, there's a new endometrium every month. So these variations aren't of any lasting consequence as far as we know. As far as the effect of combination of therapy on the cervical mucus is concerned, the story is fairly simple. Throughout the cycle, the progestogen opposes the action of the estrogen, with the result that the cervical mucus is always sparse and viscous. The spin barkite remains at one centimeter or less. Sperm survival is extremely poor in this type of mucus. And the fern test is constantly negative. It seems to me that with hostile mucus of this type present in the cervix, especially during the critical days about mid-cycle, the chance of fertilization is decreased, even if an occasional ovulation should occur. So with combination therapy, we have inhibition of ovulation, an endometrium possibly unsuitable for implantation, and a cervical mucus through which it is difficult or impossible for the spermatozoa to pass. Now let's go on to sequential therapy. In this type of therapy, exogenous estrogen is administered alone for 14 or 15 days. The inhibiting effect on ovulation is much the same as with combination therapy because estrogen alone at a sufficiently high blood level can effectively block the production of the follicle stimulating hormone. Then when progestogen is added for five or six days, it joins with the estrogen to produce secretory endometrial changes, which then assure a regular withdrawal bleeding. Therefore, as far as ovulation inhibition is concerned, the two types of oral contraceptive therapy are quite similar. Alterations in the endometrial cycle are different from those found in combination therapy, however. Due to the comparatively long period of unopposed estrogen, the proliferative period is longer than normal, lasting through day 22. The endometrial thickness is the same as during the normal cycle, but the glands show only slight tortuosity and the glandular epithelium shows marked mitotic activity and pseudostratification. At about day 23, in response to the added progestogen, a comparatively short secretory phase has begun. The glands become tortuous, and secretion appears in subnuclear vacuoles and migrates toward the lumen. Progestational evolution is arrested, and further normal changes, such as glandular exhaustion, stromal edema, and predecidua, fail to occur. If you compare all three sequences of change in the endometrium, I think you can see that the endometrium with sequential therapy is just about as different from the normal as the endometrium with combination therapy. But the difference is in the opposite direction. To go on to the next point, the effect of sequential therapy on the cervical mucus is pretty much what you might expect. During the period when estrogen is being administered alone, there is profuse secretion of thin mucus. This continues from the seventh to the 21st day. It is a mucus in which sperm can survive and move quite well. Then, when progesterone is added to the therapy, the mucus becomes scant and viscous for the remainder of the cycle. So in effect, this sequence of changes in the cervical mucus doesn't differ greatly from that found in the normal, untreated cycle. We have been discussing the various mechanisms by which fertility may be controlled. When the patient follows the regimen carefully and there is inhibition of ovulation, both methods are extremely reliable. Incidentally, I think we should suggest 
that if a physician prescribes an oral contraceptive, he should insist on seeing his patient every six months. Well, it seems that we all agree that inhibition of ovulation is probably the primary mechanism of action of oral contraceptives. However, with a combination product, the effects on the endometrium and on the cervical mucus are additional protective mechanisms. I think we would also agree that in the great majority of cases, patient acceptance is as important as theoretic effectiveness in the selection of any oral contraceptive, since strict adherence to the therapeutic regimen is essential. Finally, we are convinced that only when the physician understands how these oral contraceptives work is he able to decide which product to prescribe. And only then can he separate fact from fiction in the plethora of information that he is barraged with daily.